what are we doing? We're talking about the media archaeology of vector graphics. Um, that's a very boring, dry title. Um, and I think we'll focus a bit on vector graphics. We'll talk a lot about media archaeology. And we'll talk a lot about um, computers in general and um, the context that computers came out of. And we'll talk about blowing things up. Let's talk about blowing things up first, because I think that that's kind of an important sort of a thing. Um, one of the contexts um, that I'll be talking about, and actually I had to kill a lot of babies to make the slideshow, and I killed a few babies um, talking about cybernetics. Um, so we'll have to keep cybernetics in mind. Um, so this is our little dystopian prelude to sort of set the flavor of what comes. This is where America's peace of mind begins. Around the clock, radar's electronic eyes watch the skies and report what they see to SAGE, defense system of the United States Air Force. Here is a SAGE center on 24-hour alert. At its heart is a computer developed by a research team from MIT and IBM working with the Air Force. The SAGE computer speeds the information for decisions by man in our missile age. Every scheduled flight across American frontiers is recorded ahead of time on IBM punch cards, then fed into the SAGE computer. Now the computer can draw a picture of what is supposed to be in the sky at any moment. It continually compares this expected picture with the real picture as seen by radar. If a flying object does not belong, it appears on this viewing screen. There's one now at the right of the screen. They call it a blip, unknown flying object. Friend or foe, within seconds the Air Force will know. The officer fires a light gun at the target blip. This tells the computer to track the object. At the launching site, a long-range Beaumont missile is readied for firing. Now they ask the computer to calculate an intercept point. X marks the spot where the Beaumont missile would meet the moving target if fired immediately. The officer in charge makes the final decision. Fire. At the moment of launching, the Beaumont missile receives instructions from the IBM computer. As the missile screams toward target, radar keeps on tracking. With electronic control, the computer automatically adjusts the missile to meet any change in the target flight. There is no escape. Intercept. This was a test, one of many successful tests of the SAGE Beaumont security team, our new system of air defense. To be ready for the worst, so that the worst will never happen, America is now armed with instant electronic reflexes. The SAGE computer, made by IBM, is another example of the vast new powers that man can achieve through the creative use of his mind. Strength for national defense, speed for informed decisions, service for a growing America. This is IBM, freeing man's mind to shape the future. Okay, so these old uh, 1950s and early 60s documentaries are always very fun and corny and, and super, super kitschy. But there's some quite terrifying things going on in this, in this uh, video that um, I think also um, uh, we see echoes of these up into this day in the kind of electronic uh, politics of things. Um, the, the SAGE system was launched in, uh, was initiated, I believe, in uh, 1958. Um, and then they, they immediately started making these kind of pieces of propaganda about it. It was, um, it was a first in many ways. Um, it was a first sort of digital uh, computer system with a graphical user environment. You saw that there was a uh, interface point and click sort of device. It was also networked through a whole system because you had all these kind of bunkers around um, around the United States where these, um, these massive systems were kind of networked together to see what was going on. Um, there was different sorts of, um, uh, oh yeah, actually it was a first for, um, uh, I believe magnetic storage also, it was a very first. So there was a lot of technical innovation going on here. But some of the stuff is quite terrifying in the sense that you have this thing that um, the, the unknown, the blip, 
the thing that we don't, the thing that we can't anticipate is, uh, is the threat, and the threat must be assessed and um, either accepted or annihilated, which I find very interesting. And the kind of uh, buzzwords that come up around it, or the kind of um, slogans, this freeing man's mind to shape the future, pretty much comes out of the discourse of cybernetics, which was a, a kind of a science that came up um, immediately after the, after the Second World War as a kind of an over arching umbrella that folded in things that have to do with um, information technology especially um, and robotics and taking models from biology taking uh, cultural studies into account it was supposed to be a whole system that would uh, kind of um, uh, get information in and react to that information and put control back out. So the basis of cybernetics is a feedback loop. You get information, you react on that information, you put results back out, and you get feedback back in from the results that you put out. So this is also another kind of a cybernetic loop. But um, uh, Norbert Wiener, who was uh, actually, he was, he was American, so we can say Weiner. Um, uh, one of his kind of catchphrases in the title of his first book was a, a human use of human beings. Now, Weiner was um, not, uh, he, he broke very much with other people like John von Neumann who were um, very into this idea of armaments and even preemptive strikes against the Soviet Union because their computer simulations told them that they would win. Um, and Win. How do you win? Um, and... Uh, um, uh, uh, Weiner was he was he was much more interested in this kind of stuff for much more peaceful purposes, and his book was called Human Use of Human Beings because it was exactly this idea that we can kind of free human beings from these laborious, repetitive tasks of doing things, um, so that they can expand their creative potential actually, so that they can become better human beings at being human rather than being better cogs in a machine. Um, so what, what have we got? We've got things that like wash and fold our socks for us and uh, these little robots that run around on the lawn and keep it all nice and level. We've got a lot of free time now because we have all these machines, you know, dishwashers and stuff. What do we do with them? All this free time, we watch cat videos on the internet. This, this, this is the human use of human beings. So anyway, this discourse that IBM is, is putting forth for this weapons system echoes very much this cultural idea of, of cybernetics, um, but for what I consider a rather, a rather sinister purpose. The first part of this lecture, after our dystopian prelude, is, um, well, colloquially we can say, what the fuck is media archaeology? Uh, media archaeology is a methodology that um, I'm interested in applying to the history of technology as a way of, of seeking hidden or not so hidden aspects of the history, but also to, to check what the um, agency of the machine in the situation is, rather than just the, um, the agency of the human being. Um, Wolfgang Ernst talks about it in, in the same terms. It says he's, he's putting agency not on the, the human actors of the situation, but rather on the kinds of technologies that enabled people to do things and the, the shaping aspect that technology has. Um, and Armin Medish appears to agree with him. Um, uh, media is also quite imaginary. Um, and for imaginary media, I absolutely love this drawing. This is uh, a drawing from a, a magazine in Berlin in um, the 1920s. And in the 1920s, they imagined that people would be running around in Berlin with telephones in their pockets, talking to each other and saying, wait, I'm on, uh, well, I, can't, I actually can't read the script. It's a little too small, but I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm on the way to Alexanderplatz now. Will you meet me there? Um, and of course, this sort of, a, this sort of a cartoon is inspired by the, the discourses around uh, wireless technology. Wireless for them at that point meant radio. So they imagined everybody would have a little radio in their pocket with these really lovely old uh, telephone handsets just kind of, I don't know, clipped onto, the, uh, onto their pockets or something like that. It's a great, uh, it's a great image. So technology has these imaginary components as well. You, you have something that suggests a possible future in it. And it's packed very much inside the technology or in the promises of the technology. But as Eric Lautensberg says, um, sometimes the, the media will never deliver what those promises actually are. And so it remains imaginary. Um, 
on the other side of imaginary media, where you have things that you're imagining into the future, you have zombie media, you have undead media that rises from the grave. Things like these um, oscilloscopes that we're using, for example, and cathode ray tubes in general, are absolutely obsolete technology. Uh, you'll see Baraka and Garnet Hertz talk about this um, in this kind of curve. Like the marketing curve is a little bit interesting because you have this kind of phase where the early adopters get into something and then everybody's making I don't know, locative media. They're making geotagged pictures of, I don't know, Marmite jars or something just to prove that they can like stick some coordinates on it and uploading them to the internet. And everybody gets really excited. And then after the initial bump kind of smooths out a little bit. And at a certain point, it's just not cool to have like an iPhone 2 anymore. And they get kind of sloshed out of the system a little bit. Now, um, so that's the early adopter cycle, but the late adopter cycle is kind of interesting because what happens after you get all this technology that's been absolutely discarded um, is a mature technology that's been developed both commercially, socially, um, and it's every kind of possibility of it has been optimized in a lot of ways before it gets chucked out. Um, and it's pretty much free. Um, there's uh, a, a couple of artists in France that use these uh, mini-tel systems, which was a uh, kind of a networked information system that was set up using telephone lines that you could get. I don't know, what would you get in a mini-tel? You would get like sports and weather, and you get all this textual information onto a little terminal. And they were super cheap, and I guess for a while, almost everybody had one in their house. And now the, that network that supports those mini-tels are gone, but the objects themselves still exist, uh, at least for a while. And after the, the undead media, you have the absolute dead media. You have things that um, simply are out, have no functional use for anybody that has any commercial viability anymore. And these all get put on a boat and sent to places in India or China to kind of fill up landfills. And they become uh, what uh, Yusuf Parika says, they, they, they become a geology of media. They become part of the geological record of um, our species' time on Earth. And after our time on Earth is left, you're still going to have piles of Coke bottles and modems sitting around somewhere for somebody else, maybe an alien civilization, to dig up. Um, and these things are also made from things that are dug out of the earth in the first place. If you look at the politics of um, rare, uh, rare earth um, metals that come from Africa, there's, um, there's conflicts around the stuff that goes into your mobile phone um, constantly for access to those resources to be able to mine them. So after they've lived out their lifespan, they go back into the earth the same way we do, actually. Um, so. Part of media archaeology is looking back at stuff and thinking about the road not taken. What happens if um, we, I don't know, what happens if, we actually I was just talking um, before we started here, what if televisions had been round instead of square, for example? It's just as easy to make a, uh, make a round, actually probably easier to make a round CRT tube than a square t CRT tube. What happens if all televisions had been round? We would have a very different sort of aspect ratio. Cinema would have been totally different, who knows? Um, so it's going back and looking at things and thinking, what if? There's other associations that happen with media archaeology that have a little bit more to do just, just with the aesthetics of it. And we touch that every time that we turn on these oscilloscopes and film them, um, which is that we're interested in the, the, the cultural resonance of these objects. We're interested in what they meant at that time uh, versus what they mean now. Um, a, a television tube meant something very different in the 1970s when people like Namjoon Paik were, hiking, were hacking them because they were, they were current contemporary technology. They were something that needed to be addressed urgently as a thing that was in front of us and influencing our lives now. If I dragged out an old you know, 1950s, 1960s television tube with these gigantic garish um, you know, wooden cabinets on them or something, you know, the ones that the doors that open and close and they look like they're sideboard and you would keep like, I don't know, bottles of whiskey in there or something as well. Uh, you would have a very different cultural reaction to it now than you would at the time. So this is something that we get to play with a little bit and also think, well, what if? What if something else had happened? What if we'd taken another path? One thing that I talk a lot about when I'm, when I'm talking about technology, and I, I started doing these lectures talking more about sound technology, are these utopias and dystopias. So this is um, uh, this artistic rendition of this kind of uh, piano with these spinning fiery wheels and lasers shooting through them and things. This is a, a very mm, imaginative um, artist's interpretation of an actual... 
uh, musical instrument, which was Edwin Emil Welte's uh, Lichtton organ, the light tone organ, which I believe was 1931. Um, and if we think about a utopian electronic device of our current time, and we compare it to this utopian electronic device of the 1930s, we notice some striking dissimilarities. Uh, one of my favorite is that the artist is really taking quite good pains to show you that there's a, um, there's a power cable. This thing is plugged into the wall. It gets juice. It's alive. Um, these absolutely fantastic horn speakers that are sticking out, the um, glowing, fiery, hot tubes. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant valves. These valves that are sticking up here. Um, and, and of course, she's, um, she's having a great time. She's interfacing with the newest technology. She's rocking out with some Rachmaninoff there. And uh, she looks quite happy about it. Um, but the goal of every sort of electronic sound instrument, as you've probably been reading as I've been talking, are they, they've, they've been the same forever. They've, they've either tried to um, imitate existing instruments, and the organ is usually a, quite a classic thing. It's one of the first things that people tried to synthesize when they started building electronic instruments. Um, there's other options as well. You would want to synthesize completely unheard sounds, and I think the theremin would be a really good example of that. You would want to realize complex works without the need to uh, hire an orchestra because they're expensive and uh, the guitarist always gets all the girls and the drummer smells bad and the bassist is always drunk or something. So you would, um, you want to get rid of those people. You just want to do it yourself. And, um, and so and in, the, in the, the earliest phases of all these electronic instruments, the, the source of these technologies was very cultural. Um, the, some of the earliest uh, sound synthesis stuff was done with optical film, for example, spinning discs of optical film, which is what this instrument did originally as well. It shined a light beam through a spinning transparent disc, which had waveforms painted on it, and it converted light into sound. Um, and that's, that's something that comes from the technologies of film and also from the technologies of radio, but radio is a bit more sinister. We'll get there for a minute. So for every kind of utopia, there's always a dystopia. And um, so the dystopia here is that, um, well, let's look at this picture here for a second. Let's admire this officer's lovely trousers, for example. No, let's actually take a look at what's up here in the control compartment, in the very tip of this, the, the V2 rockets, which were launched in these uh, arcs, uh, these rainbows of gravity from the... Uh, shores of Flanders over to uh, try to blow up Winston Churchill in his bunker. Um, up here in the front, there's these two kind of locked boxes that say control compartments. And those are very early analog computers. And they were designed to um, calculate the uh, movements of the rudders to keep this thing going along its magical parabola. And they were designed to um, keep that parabola constant in spite of turbulence um, in the air and wind and things like that. So this is a very early application of a computer. And the computer was designed to more efficiently drop bombs on other people that you don't like. The um, dystopias, as you've been reading, um, in electronic sound instruments are a little bit more banal than that, some of them. Um, obviously, a, a mini Moog doesn't sound like a flute, no matter how much you patch it to sound like a flute. Um, the first responses to um, uh, especially experimental electronic music was that it was cold, alien, unemotive. Stockhausen wanted to tell everybody he came from Sirius. He wanted to convince them he came from another planet, and he used these eight cold tones to do that. Um, this problem that throughout our biological history, we're very used to the fact that if a sound happens, we know where that sound came from. We can identify it. It's part of our biological need as, you know, monkeys and trees to know where jaguars are. And uh, once you start separating that, you're doing something that's very, um, it, it's, it's very hard for our biological system to accommodate. We're very used to the idea that we can put a record on now. We can hear somebody that was, um, actually, the, the slide that I don't have is of, uh, a Native American, perhaps Sitting Bull, singing into one of these horns into a phonograph, and that guy's long gone, and the wax cylinders that he sung and recorded still exist in a basement in Berlin somewhere. So we've dislocated that sound source uh, across time and across space. And finally, um, the big axe that I'm going to be grinding is that um, al almost every kind of pr um, technology that we use for sound synthesis now 
uh, is a, it's, a, it's a historical relic from military developments. The idea that, um, I mean, let's say that the, the budgets for developing technological tools to make music are nothing in comparison to the budgets for developing technological tools to drop bombs on people. So every kind of filter, every kind of clock, every kind of oscillator, all of these things that are the basic building blocks of a synthesizer had their genesis someplace else. And that genesis was funded very much by efforts to blow each other up during the Second World War especially. Um, but before we get to the war, we have to talk about a few things. We have to talk about some typewriters. Why typewriters? This is Nietzsche's typewriter. Nietzsche was, uh, well, I think we all know who Nietzsche was. Nietzsche um, went through a, a gigantic stylistic change at a certain point in his writing career. Um, and he went from writing these very long, uh, flowing texts about Greek tragedy to writing things like Zarathustra, which uh, he referred to as philosophizing with a hammer, these short, terse, uh, aphoristic, powerful statements of things that he perceived to be truths. Now, how many of you typed on a manual typewriter? That's still quite a lot of you, and that's good. W could anybody characterize the difference between tinkling away on the keys of your MacBook and um, typing on a manual typewriter? Yeah, why? You can't erase that? Okay, that's one really good one. What else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bukowski always talks about it like boxing. He uses these boxing metaphors to talk about attacking the typewriter and things like that. Very masculine. Hmm? Yeah, and there's a sound as well. It just, it just goes bang. It's a very physical experience. What about this typewriter? What's different about this uh, uh, Marlene Hansen writing ball that, um, that's different from any of the mechanical typewriters that you used? What's the biggest difference? Uh huh? Huh? <laughs> Sorry? The arrangement of keys is circular. Can you see what you're typing? Yeah, that's the biggest difference actually, was that Nietzsche was pecking away on this thing. And, um, now, so there's the biography of Nietzsche. Um, is long and uh, very convoluted. But around this time, um, during this uh, stylistic change, he um, got a hold of this typewriter and took it with him to Italy. And it immediately started fucking up because of humidity and uh, he was still learning to kind of use this tool and pounding away at it and, oh, by the way, he had syphilis. Um, and that was rotting his brain away like an old cheese, basically. But um, he, uh, he, noti he noticed that this, uh, this machine was doing something to him. And I'm not going to blame the machine necessarily for changing his writing style, but it was very much in this period. And what he wrote was that our writing tools are also working on our thoughts, that it's a feedback loop, that actually the tools that we're using to express our ideas are going backwards into our ideas and shaping those ideas. You've got to think about what you're going to say before you type it. Um, and, and that it, maybe it has to be a little bit more terse, it has to be a little bit more punchy, it's a lot of effort, things like that. So um, there's a lot of uh, uh, typewriters out there in the history of things. Um, one uh, kind of typewriter-esque thing is a Holodus tab, tab, uh, tabulating machine, which was designed to uh, keep uh, census information. Now, um, tabulating people and assigning them things like genders and professions and incomes and social classes and all of these things is basically a, for, is, is a, is a forerunner to the idea that you can sort people by these things and you can, um, as, uh, as Foucault says, uh, you can uh, discipline and punish them much more effectively. And when Alan Turing was looking for uh, a metaphor for this universal computing machine that would revolutionize thinking about machines and how they tabulated things and computed things and calculated things and stored things. Um, the first kind of metaphor that he thought about was a somewhat infinite loop of, of a typewriter ribbon. So already the typewriter, the, this idea of the typewriter, was shaping the way that he was thinking about future technologies. This isn't uh, Turing's um, picture, by the way. It's kind of an artistic impression. We're talking about 1937. And, of course, there's typewriters of our modern era as well. And um, 
this uh, is a lovely, uh, the biggest dial on this rather popular uh, consumer synthesizer from some years ago, um, which shows you that actually you just need to mix a little trance with a little electronica, and um, it's, uh, it, it plays both kinds of music. And everything, every other kind of music that you could possibly make is simply just a distillation of some aspect of this. We can kind of get in there and get a little techno house and maybe we can mess with the preset a little bit. Um, what this kind of demonstrates is very much that this, this typewriter is working on the thoughts of its user. And the output of these kind of typewriters influences the thoughts of the users as well because the more you listen to electronica records, for example, or uh, hip-hop vintage, is that a really a genre? Let's pretend it is. Um, the more that you listen to records or go to clubs or, or see gigs or things like that, the more you get influenced by stuff that you like. And then you go back, and I was just talking with Andrew about this stuff. Um, the, the more you see and hear the stuff that you like, the more you want to go find the tools, and some people get very obsessive about looking for that particular drum machine, for example, or that particular distortion pedal. And you want to go back and you want to reproduce the steps that made that thing that you like so much so that you can then make it yourself and that becomes quite a feedback loop as well, that people go and they look for the tools to make the stuff they like, they keep making things in the exact same style that they like, and then other people kind of follow in there. Um, I would say that the, the history of uh, analog synthesizer modules in the Eurorack format is an absolute laboratory case of that situation. Um, Oh, we've already hit the next part, which is about techno science. We're going to talk about computers, and we're going to talk a little bit about what kind of typewriters computers can be. Um, the definition of computer is going to be rather wide here, and it might show you some things that you didn't think about as being computers before. And lots of them had to do with blowing things up. So let's look at some other examples of blowing things up for a second here. Fire control computers solve fire control problems. Their solutions depend upon own ship's course and speed, target's range, target's bearing, target's course and speed, wind speed and direction, initial shell velocity, and other factors up to a possible total of 25. The factors occur simultaneously, and many are constantly changing. But the computer continuously and instantly solves the problem and sends the answer to the guns as train and elevation orders. A computer cannot do this without men. For example, men operate the director, which sends target range and bearing to the computer. And here at the computer, other men set in other information. Obviously, computer accuracy depends on the quality of the information it receives. And that depends on the skill and understanding of the men. If you look inside a computer, you find an impressive assembly of basic mechanisms. Some of them are duplicated many times in one computer. A first step toward understanding a computer is understanding these mechanisms. This film, part one, describes four of them. Okay, I would love to show you two more hours of spinning gears and camshafts and things, but um, I think we have to move on a little bit. Um, but this is the kind of technology that's controlling um, different sorts of weaponry that was begun, um, these kind of investigations were begun in the Second World War. This film from 1944 um, has the provocative title of Flack. A heavy gun shell takes roughly one second to climb 1,000 feet. It would take then about 27 seconds for a shell to reach the 27,000 foot level. This plane represents a bomber formation flying 200 miles per hour. If the gun is aimed directly at the planes at the time the shell is fired, the formation will have moved on almost two miles before the shell reaches their altitude. That's why a gunner always leads his target, like a hunter firing at ducks in flight. The hunter must fudge his lead and aim ahead of the duck, if he is to hit it. But because of the great altitude and speed of a bomber, the anti-aircraft gunner cannot rely on dead reckoning. His leading must be a careful mathematical calculation. 
First, the aircraft is picked up in an optical sight and held on the crosshair. The sight keeps tracking it continuously, obtaining its direction and angular height while a stereoscopic rangefinder determines the altitude. At night or in bad weather, the aircraft may be tracked solely by radar. Whether tracked by optical sight or by radar, the information is fed by electric cable to a director. This mechanical quiz kid digests the data and automatically computes the right lead, setting the guns. So they will fire not at where the target is now, but at where it will be at the end of the shell's time of flight. The director will then go on automatically adjusting and setting the guns as long as the planes remain in range. Of course, guns do not fire singly, but in batteries of four or six. Our symbol now represents the heavier fire of a whole battery making a continuous pattern of bursts along the plane's course. Often, several batteries are within range and all fire with a proper lead, as produced by their own fire control instruments. Each battery maintains predicted fire until it can no longer reach the attacking planes. But new batteries take up the firing as soon as they come within range. This is called continuously pointed fire. Continuously pointed fire. So um, what we can see there is, um, let's say, early examples of the kinds of automated weaponry that were very actively developing now. Um, and, and I've been very laborious about showing you these things because some of these devices are going to come back uh, a little bit later in our story, uh, repurposed into other means. But these are essentially um, either mechanical or electromechanical um, devices into which you can input information by you know, cranking knobs around and things, and that this machine kind of spins around physically and starts to deliver you information um, as an output, and that information as an output can then be used to direct these kinds of devices. Um, this is a, on the left, a 40 millimeter uh, Beaufort anti-aircraft gun, which was used uh, quite widely by the Allies during the Second World War. Um, in the middle is uh, a character that we're going to meet again very soon. This is the M5 gun director, um, which was developed in, um, in Great Britain first and called the Kerrison predictor. And to give you an idea of the scale of those types of machines, um, there's an M2 gun director on a trailer in the, in the last uh, slide there. Um, it just kind of gives you an idea of the, the scope of these things. It's not a utopian device that goes in your pocket by any means. It weighs quite a lot and involves uh, thousands of moving parts in order to make these kinds of calculations. And of course, it relies very much on a highly trained uh, human operator, which can interpret visual data about where planes are, for example, and uh, be able to input it accurately into this device, which then controls the elevation, the angle, of this gun and also the um, time of the fuse because the time of the fuse is very important. The shell doesn't just hit the thing, it has to explode somewhere in the vicinity of it and shrapnel it out. Um, so here's a, a little slide from the, uh, the, the, the makers of this, uh, these Sage computers. Um, a very small note uh, that actually these, uh, this computer console that this guy was sitting in, not only did it have a, a light gun for the one side, but actually there was an ashtray on the other side. Um, but the, 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 the goals of, um, they're going to be sitting there a long time, you know. And the goals of, of uh, World War II era computing were very specific. Um, you, you wanted, a, let's say, a cybernetic approach to modeling complex phenomena. And we want to be able to take lots of streams of information and distill them down into something that we find very useful. We want interactive control through vi virtualization. We want to virtualize that thing. We want to abstract it from the real phenomenon, which has far too much information, and most of it might be considered unnecessary to us. And we want to make a virtual construct of it, where we've reduced as much of the information as possible in order to more easily control it. And finally, this convergence of, of simulated and real events. Uh, the convergence of the simulated and the real event in the case of the SAGE is impact. The missile hits the target and removes it from the game. Uh, Paul Krogan writes that to predict the future is to foreclose the future. In other words, to predict things, um, we've suddenly removed a lot of the possibilities of what the future actually is, and we're aiming at one in particular. We've gotten rid of the messy real world, the analog world, not even the analog world, the real, real world. Of, of its messiness, and we've cleaned it up and we've made it a very abstracted piece of information over which we can uh, simulate, predict, 
and ultimately control. Um, these are very important terms. Should I highlight them? Simulation, prediction, and control. Um, here's a physics simulation. We're going to look at actual like vector stuff now. This is actually one of the first um, computer-generated uh, films um, by uh, Edward Zayats, who I've been told has a very uh, Slovene name, if I'm not mistaken. This is a computer-made movie. The box represents a satellite, which is now in a circular orbit going over the poles. In the upper right, a clock counts off the number of orbits. He's giving us the silent treatment right this now, but he'll explain it in a second. Made movie. Gravity gradient of the box, box represents a satellite, satellite long which is now in a circular orbit, orbit going over the poles. Exactly this In the upper right, one face a clock the counts off the number of orbits. Years. This is very useful for weather or communication satellites. Gravity gradient torque and force the satellite's camera, long axis to point toward the Earth. Desired. Exactly this effect keeps one face of the moon the always the pointing toward the Earth. To look at the satellite, this is very useful for weather or communication satellites satellite is doing where well. either an Earth-pointing camera or an Earth-pointing antenna is desired. Here is the same motion. Okay. There's the a lot of spinning effect. that happens after. And then he gives you some other views of the, of the spins. Maybe we can see here very quickly without the advertisements um, that he's trying to show you what's going on kind of inside the box with the gyroscopes and things like that. But basically what he's done is he's, he's, he's taken these uh, mathematical the physics models. Then comes to rest on the screen. He's taken mathematical physics models and he's virtualized them and tried to show them to you in a very controlled way with this very basic sort of um, computer rendered um, uh, vector graphics. Um, uh, for, I think anybody, that's, uh, anybody that studies computer graphics should at least know about um, Ivan Sutherland and Sketchpad. But we'll look, at, uh, we'll look at some demonstrations of Sketchpad in a second here, and we'll see some very um, innovative, novel things that became part of our lives much later. Oops, we're not there yet. We met... In order to construct a meaningful engineering drawing, we have to have several graphical manipulations. Ivan Sutherland's programs can draw straight lines and circles. Well, that's about what you do in the, the drafting equipment anyway, isn't it? That's uh, a very good start. <laughs> right. In order to do this, we can position this bright spot in the middle, middle of the cross that you notice at a desired location. And we press the button to command the computer to draw a line. It will draw a line from this position where I am now to any subsequent position of my light pen. This is much like a rubber band stuck in two pins. One is nailed on the, on the, the screen here, and the other is at my light pen. So I can position this anywhere I want. Mm -hmm. Now, I lost tracking there. I moved the pen too fast. Let's, uh, let's skip the long discussions about user interface errors, and at least notice that this is, for 1963, this is actually, I think, the same year that Zayats made his film. Uh, this is super novel. I mean, p uh, the way that people have been interfacing with computers up to this point have been punch cards. Um, and all of a sudden, there's not only a display that's showing you a picture, but it's a picture that you can change just by touching it and moving it around. That is, um, that's revolutionary. So they ask him, well, yeah, that's a 2D picture. You can draw a circle or a square. Uh, what about 3D pictures? And they answer. They answer. Now here we have a representation of a uh, piece of wood, perhaps, which is all of the lines of the sections behind each piece are hidden. As you'll see, as I start to rotate this object, the computer will place part of it behind the other part, and you will see that indeed the computer has a representation of it which knows that it's solid. It's no longer just that wire frame, it really is solid, and when a line is behind the front surface, you just don't see it. That's right. It's wow, that's um, what they're talking about there is something that I haven't seen so many people implement in their vector art yet, which is that hidden line problem. How do you make it look like it's a flat surface facing you rather than a transparent wire frame? Well, they worked it out in 1963. I think most of the vector artists in this room were still struggling with that one. How many of you, how many of you have worked out? Have you guys worked it out, Chris? A little? Okay. But it's not so easy, is it? 
Okay, oh good, okay. See, there's, there's interconnectivity between all these things. Um, now, I can show all these kind of wonders, but what you have to realize um, is that they show me really weird ads, but um, this Boren album is uh, highly recommended. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, what you have to realize is that the places where that these things are being developed in the, in the 50s and the 60s um, are, are funded almost entirely by military money. The, 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 the kind of resources that were, that were necessary to develop um, things like anti-aircraft controllers or mm, the atomic bomb required an amazing amount of resources to be poured into things um, in the 1940s and in the 1950s you had this DARPA which was this defense related um, project which was very much about pooling engineering resources to make um, first and foremost the most powerful military you could possibly make in the most technologically advanced military. One thing I didn't mention by the way about the SAGE project which I think is kind of interesting is that it was initiated in 1958 and it was designed exclusively to defend against um, attack by airplanes flying over you to drop nuclear weapons. Um, now, by the time that this system was actually initiated, I think in 1950, well, anyway, a few years before that, they had already very much um, tested and started to deploy uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, which travel at speeds um, uh, far in excess of an airplane and would that, that system would simply never respond to fast enough anyway. It was actually obsolete from day one. That didn't matter. They spent tons of money, they put it out there and um, they used it as a propaganda piece to uh, let Americans feel safer and maybe send chills down the spine of Ivan over in Russia or something like that. It became a propaganda exercise as well. Um, but the kind of resources that were being poured into this military advancement um, gave fruit to things which were not necessarily exclusively military tools. And that's how things, um, they say, trickle down into industry a little bit. Um, but the industry use of these things um, in a non-military context was always, uh, always lagging behind and um, certainly wasn't the, the, the prime uh, generator of the kind of money that was necessary. Um, flight simulators also, we'll come back to flight simulators a little bit. Um, this is a quite later uh, uh, piece of thing, but it's still very, very vector. Um, and this is actually interesting because it was, um, it was run on PDP uh, machines, which we'll see some pictures of in a little while in action. Um, and this was also uh, linked over the early uh, computer network, the, the ARPANET, which was, um, the, uh, as, as many of us know already, the predecessor of the internet. Um, so the terminal, I think the terminal was the PDP-1 and the PDP-10 was a time-shared machine on the other end of a telephone line that was sending information. So, whoops. We're not going to look at art yet. We're, oh, I'm spoiling all my surprises. 7-9 Juliet, go ahead. 7-9 Juliet, final runway niner. Flight simulation. 7-9 Juliet, clear to land runway The pictures you see have been generated by a computer graphics system at Harvard University. Right towers in Missouri. Okay, that's a pretty um, wire-framey runway to land your wire-framey um, uh, airplane on. But um, this is how people were, were trained to do things. Actually, some of the earlier flight simulators just were like a box that you climbed into and they just kind of tilted it around. They didn't even show you anything, which was even funnier. Um, so this is obviously a very uh, military and also civil aviation um, use of these kind of uh, interactive vector technologies. And what we have there is very much a virtualization of reality. We've removed almost all the extraneous detail and we've reduced it down to the most essential components that are necessary to train a person how to fly an airplane.